little big noise, and it's just, let's just call it a feature. It's kind of like when you have software, and it doesn't work the way you want to work, it's somewhere you can just call it a feature. So, you know, it's a feature of having a steeple. <laughs> so, that's the way it is. Um, I think I need to make a couple quick announcements, though, uh, before we get into the message. Is uh, I, I want people to know next Sunday is men's meeting, so men's meeting types, you know, be here. We'll have burgers and dogs and have a nice fellowship time and a good visit. Um, and Karen, I want to pray for you real quick because I know you know the idea is the the ladies group finished up so that Karen uh, can prove to the doctors that you know she doesn't need that new knee yeah. and it's still in progress about for that. So thank you, Lord God, for your blessing upon Karen. I pray that everything go well with the surgery and that everybody have skill and ability and it just be totally great and that um, she's able to dance on that new knee in the name of Jesus. But, so we have that, and then on the 29th, two weeks from today, we're having potluck, okay? Everybody bring a autumn theme thing. We'll get together, we'll have some fellowship time, and it will be a good thing. And so feel free to bring something. There's a sign-up list out there. Something you have to sign up. It's just so they don't want to duplicate, you know, totally everybody bringing the same thing. But if you did, then that's okay. We'll still enjoy it. We'll just... You know, everybody bring mashed potatoes and then we'll have a nice meal with mashed potatoes. Or whatever it is. But the, there is a sign-up list out there and it will be a good visit. And so feel free to uh, join in with us with that. And then in December, I know it's, it seems like December is a long way off, but it's not. It's only eight weeks until December 10th, which is when we have our annual Christmas banquet here for the church. So put that on your calendars and make sure that, you know, that and that's in the bulletin too okay so we're going to talk about some stuff and now these are the words of jesus pray earnestly to the lord of the harvest those that's what jesus taught and so we're going to understand what that means but we're also going to understand what that means in relationship to the crazy mixed up world that we have today and what's going on in the middle east somewhat and so you, you, you may think, what do those things have to do with each other? Hang with me for a little bit. I know some of you all think sometimes I'm kind of cookie with the way I go and, and stuff on these messages. But this is all going to tie together. And the Holy Spirit has a message, I think, for each and every one of us to get out of this thing today. And so I want you to just be open to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to your hearts today in this message and what the Scripture has to say. Okay? That's cool. And oh, by the way, I want to welcome the people who are on video from Africa. Justin and whoever else, Catherine, if you're there, welcome. We're glad you're online. And anybody else that may be online today. And so, Jesus, okay, the, the thing is off its thing about where the slides are. So, if somebody could go up to the sound booth and put it back onto the scripture slides, that would be great. Where we're at on this, but until somebody goes upstairs and clicks on the first scripture slide so that it's set up. Um, anyway, Curtis, all you have to do is go up there to that computer up there. And then, oh, there we go. It's done. Thank you. Is somebody? Up? Oh, Bill is up there. I can't see you through the lights up there. Thank you. All right. Then Jesus went through the cities. In villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction of course the more we become conformed in an image of Christ the more we do that as part of our nature of stuff too about teaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God and caring for other people and healing and dealing with afflictions that people have we become more and more like Jesus and that's what he was trying to get across as we went through but that's leading into this concept of what Jesus taught here in a second that we're going to focus on. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know, God 
Gaza is probably one of the most densely populated places in the world. It was before this week. It's getting smashed because people are leaving and trying to get out. But there's not really any way out. In the good people, there are many good people. They don't have jobs. They don't have anything. And it's, life is difficult. There's one Israeli soldier that I was listening to on online on the news last night said, you know, we would arrest people when they came out. They weren't supposed to be in Israel coming out of Gaza. They were coming out because they wanted to get put in jail in Israel because they knew they could get fed and get water. This was before the war started. There's a lot of people there that are struggling. And it's like the people that Jesus was giving them. They're harassed and they're helpless. And it's a challenging, difficult life. And the, the terrorists are controlling. It's kind of like having the mob. The mafia control a city. Except this is a large, several square mile area. The issue is, is that they're they're harassed. They don't they don't have the ability to break out right, on their own. Jesus was worried about the crowds because he saw that they were harassed and helpless. And he said, "The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers." Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I want us as a body to get to the point where we can pray earnestly, God, your will be done. You send people into the world. Bring to the harvest. Doesn't matter what their background is, what their ethnic is, what they've done in the past, we want to bring people into relationship with Jesus. Right? We want to have more and more and more people come into the kingdom of God. We want the kingdom of God to expand and just embrace as many people as possible. Regardless. And so sometimes people think, oh, you know, if I pray for people, God to send people into the harvest, he's going to send me. Well, maybe. But the idea is, is that God's calling you to go into the harvest. You're going to want to do that. That's going to be something you're going to feel called to do, and you're going to have people say, don't do that. And you're going to say, yes, I am. It's not that God's going to force you to do that. But God calls people into things. And sometimes we end up in a place and we don't know how in the world did I get there. But God is using you. Oh, no, I never set out to become a pastor. It just, it just it happened. God made it happen. Right? And sometimes I wonder, is it the best? You know, am I really the best you could do for all of these people? You know, but the idea is, is that God's putting people, regardless of their capabilities, in the positions to accomplish his objective. And why does he put us, like Paul says in letters to the Corinthians about the jars of clay? Because in my weakness, I'm strong because that's when God gets the glory. Because God works through people in their shortcomings and their failures. Okay? So don't ever think that you can't accomplish God's will in your life. Because you don't want to, in your strength, accomplish God's will. You want God to work through you and the Holy Spirit to work through you to accomplish God's will in your life, right? You see the difference? That doesn't mean you don't do anything. God wants you to try and effort and put something into it, but he wants his will to be done in his way. But in any case, the idea is that there are laborers out there in the field. There are people that are taking risks all the time for the sake of the kingdom of God. And sometimes that's a challenge, right? You can live on cycles, right? Your husband can be sailing the boat, hit, 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 you know, and then coming back out right before the war started, right? You know, we all need to make part of the sisters. Anyway, if you haven't. The, the idea here is, is that there's great testimonies there, by the way. Anyway, the idea is, is that God has laborers in the harvest. 
There may be more laborers in the harvest now than there ever were in history, but there's still a need for more because the population is greater and the need is greater. And where I'm going with this message today is to say that, hey, look, what's going on in the Middle East is just an example and an indicator of where the world is going toward all the end times stuff. Right? It's an example of what it is. I'm not saying today is the end times. I'm saying it's an example of what's coming. You know, the chaos and the violence and the everything else. And we're going to see that how that is here in a second. <clears throat> but, you know, the... <laughs> so some of my uh, old classmates were all retired, they're all out of the military, all out of the Navy. But, you know, they're talking about all this stuff <clears throat> that's going on in the Middle East. And I promise you, there are people ready to launch off the carriers, off the Air Force bases, off of the Army things, wherever they are, and go in because the world is on a brink right now. And I'm not trying to be scary or anything like that because I have confidence that Jesus Christ is, you know, is capable of dealing with us, protecting us and stuff. What I'm talking about is the world is in chaos and we need to stand up spiritually as well as physically in other ways to stand up for righteousness, right? You know, the deal is, is you know, I mentioned last week, you know, the carriers are moving to position in the Eastern Med. I'm sure the Air Force is deploying stuff to the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm sure that everything is ready to go. That if Iran tries to raise up something and start something in the Northeast, Jordan happens, you know, all of that stuff is going to get bigger. We don't want that. We don't want it to get bigger. We want to pray for the peace of Israel. We want it to stay constrained. When Bonnie went to Israel years ago, she landed in Israel the day that Israel went into Lebanon. Well, that would be an adventure. Soldiers everywhere, everybody's up high. Trash cans behind houses getting booby trapped. You know, and it's just terrorist things. This is far more beyond that. This is far greater than that. And so let's talk about what our responsibilities are and stuff. First of all, then, <clears throat> in First Timothy, I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. So let's make sure we understand supplication is an urgent request sent up to God because God's the only one that can deal with that problem. That's what a lot of supplication is. You know, prayers are the usual routine kind of prayers that you might talk, you know, to God about, you know, conversation with God or people ask you to pray about something. Intercession is when you stand in the gap for somebody else, whether they're godly or not. You're standing in the gap for them and you're calling upon God's blessing upon them for their salvation, but also for their blessing and well-being. That's an intercession. And thanksgiving is being thankful. It's straightforward. It's about being thankful, God, for what you've done for all of us. And we're thankful, Lord God, that you're going to bring people into the faith of Jesus Christ and into the kingdom of God through all of this seemingly crazy conflict that's going on in the Middle East. But we pray for kings. And we pray for all kinds of people who are in high positions that we may lead it peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That's what God's calling us to do. And I've said it many times. Pick a prayer target in government and you pray for that person. Even if you don't like their politics, you pray for them. You pray for God's blessing upon them and for their salvation and that they learn to come in alignment with God's purposes and seek God's direction. Whether it's somebody in the Supreme Court, somebody in Congress, somebody in the White House, whatever it is, now, you're like, well, why do I need to do that? God knows what's, God's in control. Yeah, God's in control, but God says to do it. Jesus said to do it. Scripture says to do it. This, I don't, this, is, this is the way God has set it up. He wants his people to pray for these things. Right? I've heard people teach the thing about God doesn't do anything unless people pray. I don't think that that's really true because God created the world out of nothing. And there wasn't anybody here to pray and ask God to create the world. So God does stuff without people praying. But the idea here is, is that God wants us to pray and respond, and he responds to those things. 
This is what God's called us to do. So he wants us to pray, and he wants us to do it this way for the benefit of what's going on. Because he says it's good. It is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. It pleases God when we do it his way. He desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants everyone to be saved. Even stony rotten terrorists. He wants them to forsake their crooked evil ways and turn to God. And so you can pray that God intervene and reveal himself. Even if you can't be there, if you Christians can't be there because they've been killed, you know, summarily, you can pray to God that Jesus reveal himself and convert their hearts, convert their lives to the truth. He wants everyone to come to knowledge of the truth. All people come to knowledge of the truth. So now let's talk about this for a little bit in terms of evil. evil. We're going to go back to the days of Noah for this example. And I have to put this into a little bit of context. You know, some people say, oh, the flood story. We can't believe it. Well, I believe it. I believe the flood story really happened. But I want to tell you that there are people groups, ancient people groups all over the world that have a story of a universal flood. Now, the details vary. You know, what birds got sent out from the, from the ship, how big the ship was, how it happened. You know, things like that. But I'm going to say that the pagan world, the kingdom of darkness, the Satan thing, will take the truth and they'll twist it. And they'll bend it to the purposes to distract people from the faith. So if you went to the ancient Babylonian type story of the flood, right? Their story was, it's kind of funny actually in some ways, that you know the gods got mad because people were making too much noise. Yeah. And, and you're, you're disturbing my sleep and my nap, so they got tired of people, so we're going to wipe them out. We're going to get rid of them. Which is weird considering that people were created to feed the gods with sacrifices, and so the gods get hungry if there's no sacrifices. So, it, why would they wipe people out if they're their servants? But that's this is their version of the flood. This is a pagan version of the flood story. And so, they, they were going to wipe them out, but one of the gods decided this is not a good idea. So, he told one of his followers to build an ark, put animals on it, and da 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 you know, kind of like Noah, but you know, so it was secret though. And then and they unleashed the flood, and then the gods got scared because they unleashed this flood, and they couldn't control it, and they, they, they were scared. And then, the, you know, go read the story. Anyway, the, the issue is, is that, so they couldn't deal with it, and then the flood ended, and the, this guy that, that, that survived the flood, he got out, he, he was sacrificed, he made a sacrifice to the gods, and all the gods got, showed up because, oh, I weren't sacrificed, because they were hungry. I that. What kind of gods get hungry like that? I mean, I mean. And so this is the kind of thing that's going on, right? And then one of the chief gods, because there's a whole pantheon, right? He always said, oh, where'd this human come from? Okay, so their chief gods are neither all-knowing, right? They're not omnipresent, they're not this, they're not that. The Judeo-Christian view of the flood, God knew what was going on. God was dealing with wickedness. God was dealing with evil. He wasn't dealing with inconvenience, right? He didn't deal with people with the flood because it was bothering him, because of the noise, but because of evil, corruption. And so it's vastly different. Everything about Biblical stories is vastly different from the pagan stories. Even if people want to try and tell you, oh, it's all the same stuff, it's not the same. God is very different. Let's go back and make sure we know that Noah walked with God because he was righteous before God. So Noah, Moses, Abraham, Enoch, these people had a relationship with God. Jesus called his disciples to walk with him like a rabbi. That's what they did. When you 
following the rabbi, you live with the rabbi, you mate with the rabbi, you walk with the rabbi, you got dusty because the rabbi is dust walking down these dusty roads, got on you. You walk with the rabbi. That's how you become righteous. That's how you become sanctified. Spend time with God, with the Word of God, worshiping God. So, now, in the Genesis story of the flood, the earth was corrupt, right? As I mentioned. It's not because people made too much noise, it's because it was corrupt. People were corrupt. And the earth was filled with violence. The word in Hebrew for this type of violence is Hamas. The same word, spelled the same way as the terrorist group. This is not an accident. Terrorist organizations use their names for their political agenda purposes, right? Okay. In Arabic, the, the, the name of the terrorist group is something to the effect of, of the um, <clears throat> Islamic resistance movement. Okay, When you spell it out in Arabic, it, it, it comes out H-A-M-A-S. Right? But the idea is Islamic resistance movement. And that, that's the acronym for it. But the word really is the same. This is an intentional selection, right? So that when Israel hears it, people that know Hebrew, because they're speaking Hebrew, they understand that this group intends violence, sinful violence, extreme wickedness. That's what they intend. And the Arabic side is we're hard, we're strict, we're severe. That's the way they act. That's the way they act toward their own people. That's why that they steal the aid that comes from government agencies find out the people in Gaza and the West Bank. They're using it for their terrorist things. The people who live in poverty because of terrorist organizations steal it. They're corrupt. They're evil. Right? Don't let anybody tell you that these people, the, the terrorists, are trying to defend themselves from oppression. No. They're evil. The kingdom of darkness is evil. It's behind this stuff. <clears throat> okay? So the world was corrupt, and that's what we were dealing with. But God said, no, I've determined to make an end of all of this because of the violence that the world is killing. That is a picture of the end times, when the church is taken out from the world. And whether you believe in the rapture or when it happens or whatever, is immaterial. When the church is out of the world, Violence in the end times is going to increase extremely. Right? This is just a picture, an example of the future. And so while we can, we pray that God bring peace, that God redeem people, and redeem people out of their violent and corrupt nature. Right? And sometimes people think, oh, these people can't be saved. They can't. Yes, they can. God can save anybody. God can redeem anybody because that's why Jesus died. The, Jesus didn't die for the easy cases. <clears throat> the Word of God says that Jesus died for the atonement. He rose again for the sake of all. He wants all to be saved. To reach full knowledge of the truth of God. And what it means to live in the kingdom. What some people call the full gospel thing about really living the kingdom on earth today. You can live the kingdom on earth today. It isn't about just getting saved and then just kind of stumbling and struggling through life until you go to heaven. It's about having a relationship with God, walking with God like Noah, or the disciples following Jesus, and living the kingdom of life today. But the issue is, is in the end times, Jesus said, and it's going to be like in the days of Noah, right? It'll be the coming of the Son of Man. Because, you know, they're celebrating, they're eating and drinking and having a good time. And all of a sudden, this stuff happens. And they were unaware. They were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. You don't know when. I don't know either. No one does. And you also don't know when your life is going to end. Don't think that you can just like live your life. Eh, 
oh, I'll come to Jesus someday. I'll get it straightened out. I'll walk with him someday in the future. You know, I'm going to live for the world today and have a good time. You're going to be damaged by that corruption and that sin, and you don't know when that day is going to come. But the point is, is that they didn't know it was coming. Just like in Israel, when this stuff started, what was happening? It was the end of the holiday season of Sukkot. Festival of Booths, right? It was the end of Sukkot. There was a holiday festivities going on. People were celebrating. The secular people were having parties. You know, the church people were doing church things. You know, you know, you know. and it was on Shabbat. Shabbat. It was, you know, it was on Sabbath day. And it was in a day or so of the 50th anniversary of Yom Kippur War. Knew exactly what they were doing. They had a plan. People didn't know they were taking over the earth. Not to mention, with that many rockets coming in from that short a distance, you know, the Iron Dome and all that stuff would be overwhelmed with a number of things coming in. But the idea here is, is that it's just like Jesus taught them about the coming and God. So, what's our response? Pray to the Lord of the harvest that He send workers into the field. No problem. If you if you work and you take money and you put it into the good missions program, people who are actually accomplishing something for the kingdom of God, that's just just uh, in my opinion. I've not ever been to the Greek, but in my opinion, that's just as good as you be doing because you're putting effort into it. You're working. You're enabling, supporting that godly mission. Because God has not destined us for wrath. God has destined us believers for blessing. He's not destined us for wrath. He's destined us for salvation. He has, he, even for Columbus. Right? It, it's, it's really not a straight age. A little Hebrew lesson. It's more like, uh, it's like Bach, you know, when you say Hamas. That's the way it should be pronounced. I have a hard time saying it. But the idea is, is that, am I getting close on the Hebrew? Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so the, the idea here is, is that we need to remember that even Hamas isn't destined by God. They're corrupt. They've been blinded by the enemy. They've been blinded by Satan. But God can redeem them if they return to Jesus, to Yeshua, the Messiah. Right? That can be done. But how does that happen? Because Jesus said, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the field of the harvest. The amazing thing in this little bitty tiny church, you know, how much goes into missions? Missions committee buys this money up, sends it to different things you know, in Africa or in Denton, Texas, or Gainesville, trying to advance the kingdom of God, to get people into that state of salvation of walking with Jesus. It's just, it's amazing to me how blessed to be when you follow God's thing, God's direction, God's plan. Isaiah said, if you just follow my ways, speaking for God, just follow my ways, your peace will flow like a river. That shalom type peace holistic peace, not just the absence of conflict, but all the blessings and well-being and goodness that comes from God. And your victory, blessing, well-being would be less the waves of the sea. You just follow God's ways. Right? It's just amazing. It's not some false gospel prosperity message thing. That's about God intends to bless his people. He also says that he will bless whoever blesses Israel. He will condemn whoever hates and attacks anyone. Right? Remember, 
Christians, believers, according to Galatians 3.23, merely by belonging to Christ, you are the heirs to the posterity, the heirs of Abraham, the posterity that he has promised. You come under the blessings of Abraham merely by belonging to Christ. Right? Doing what Abraham did. So what I want us to do is what scripture says to encourage one another, build one another up in this. This is not a feel bad message. This is a thing of God is victorious. God is going to win, right? It doesn't matter what it looks like now. You know, so <clears throat> last week, Tony's always on my case because, you know, I get to the end of the first quarter of the Cowboys game and I said, it's done. That's over. I'm going to stop wasting my time. Don't give up. Never give up. You know, they're not done yet. And it's just like, and I'm like, you have a lot of faith. <laughs> and because it's like, man, I'm cutting my losses. I'm out of here. I go into the other room. She's calling to me from the living room. I oh, what's going on TV. Am I kidding? No. Oh, okay. I'm doing this. Anyway, the idea is that it's not like that with God. Right? God wins. And you are victorious in Christ. And so I want to encourage us in that. So even though this looks spooky and scary, and it is, to be honest, look, I've been out there on the carrier. I used to look out the hangar window at the air carriers at the piers and think, you know, through the Cold War. Oh, ground Zero. You know that we're targeted. We knew we were targeted. We knew if there was a preemptive strike, we were going to be vaporized. I mean, you know, this is just is real, right? They train us and let us and say, you know, condition us. That's just life. You're cannon fodder, but you're there to save your country, right? That's just the way it is. And so there literally are people. They're sitting in the aircraft. They're sitting in fires. The weapons are loaded. All they have to do <clears throat> is flip the switches, start the engines. With X on the deck, with full pins, and they're going to launch them. That's the way it is right now. There's cruise missiles loaded into tubes on the submarines off the coast of Israel. They call for help. The air blows up over there. That's just the way life is. But you know what? Even if that happens, all that does is say, Jesus is coming back soon. And I want us to be encouraged on that. But I want us to carry out what Jesus said. To pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the field. Let's stand, please. And let's pray. I would like you to open your thoughts up, allow Holy Spirit to plant some thoughts into your mind. If you would, please. Holy Spirit isn't going to force you. You have to open yourself up and say, Holy Spirit, show me how you want me to pray. For whom should I pray? How should I do that? How do I pray that more laborers go into the field? Or should I put money in positions? Should I do this? Should I do that? What, what do you want me to do, Lord? What's your calling on my life for this? So let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Father God, I thank you for wonderful people who love me. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to our hearts right now and to our minds, showing us for whom we should pray. More labor. We're praying to you, Lord. I remember that. Not for two of whom we should pray, four of whom we should pray, Just that laborers go into the field. And that people be turned to you, Lord Jesus, because you want everyone to be saved and reach full knowledge of the truth of God, to live the kingdom of God on earth now, today, even in the Middle East, 
anywhere in the world, Lord God, there are so many people who need you. There are people who are scared, there's people who are worried, there's people who are in pain, there's people who are hungry, there are people who are thirsty, there are people who are in intense emotional distress because of their loved ones and their children who have been murdered and massacred and severely badly treated, Lord God. There is so much pain, but Lord God, we know that you have a solution to that pain in Jesus Christ, that you can bring redemption you can bring order out of this chaos. We bless your holy name, Lord God. We bless your name. We stand with Israel. We stand in peace. We pray shalom. Shalom, Israel. Lord God, we thank you. Lord, bring peace. Bring peace. Bring salvation. Bring healing. Bring wholeness. Bring redemption. But we also know that there needs to be justice. We also know that there needs to be righteousness needs to prevail. Evil cannot be allowed to stand. So we know that justice and righteousness has to go forth, just like with the blood. Because this evil, this extreme evil, must be crushed. That it can be crushed with salvation, just as well as with lives. And even better, because salvation that changes evil is permanent. Weapons are temporary. But Lord God, rather than putting incendiaries and high explosives on target, we want to put spiritual power on target. Lord God, we want your power to go forth and convert hearts. We're praying that your power, your energy, change and redeem people in Israel, in Gaza, in the West Bank, the Golan, and all through this world. I pray this, Father God, in the name of Jesus. And we're going to pray a blessing upon everybody here, and then we'll be dismissed. And the blessing we're going to pray today is what's called an Aaronic blessing, but it's the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, thus shall you bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom, peace to you. Thank you for being here today. Y'all have a great day. Have a blessed week.